I am never getting married. You picked a beautiful ring. Thank you. I have a great relationship. Mm -hmm. You know, in like relationships, like you see something on TV and you're like, oh, I remember. I have some questions about women. Uh, We're never having kids. I think my relationship with women has been really good. We're never having another kid. I'm pregnant. The, the most difficult part about a relationship is that Good morning, everybody. How are you doing today? You glad to be at church? Come on, we excited to be at church. Welcome to all of you watching by the internet. How many of you feel that way sometimes about relationships? Uh, I love when Bart goes, I have some questions about women. And Homer just says, uh, you know, that's kind of a trick question, isn't it? Uh, it's exciting because this month we're going to tackle some great uh, questions and uh, thoughts about relationships, covering a little bit of everything, not just uh, dating or marriage, but relationship principles that can apply across every type of relationship we have, whether that's our work relationships, coworkers, our bosses, uh, our relationships with the Lord especially. So today we're going to dive in to this new series, Relationships Uncensored. But I'm so glad to see you here today. I'm glad to be back in Alabaster, Alabama. Do you know this church? Listen, I want to tell you, I've been bragging on you guys so much because do you realize that just this year alone, and I don't know if you're aware of this because time's going by, we just completed only the first month of the year. Do you know 31 people have already said yes to Jesus at Cultivate Church? Can we just honor the Lord for that. Last week, six people alone said yes to Jesus. And everything that we do, when you know, you know, if you if you play, I understand there's some kind of sporting competition tonight. I think Jordan mentioned something about the Super Bowl. I don't know much about it. I think that's great. Um, you know, I I don't know who, even who's playing, but I feel like the Alabama uh, elephants are going to take it. Roll Tide. I mean, that's all I know. <laughs> so I feel like something good's going to happen tonight. So I'm praying for our team. I hope um, hope Alabama can pull it through. But uh, when you think about different stuff that we do, there's there's got to be a win. There's got to be a marker to know if you're winning. I feel like around here we put a lot of work, a lot of time. Many of you serve so incredible. I'm really blown away by the heart of this church with our Columbiana campus because not only did we send 50 people who live in that community uh, to launch the church, but also about 60 other people from right here are driving past uh, what is closest to them to continue to another part of the county to serve until more people are plugged in to the ministries in, uh, in Columbiana. And today is Roots 1.0 for them this afternoon. So there's people signed up and, and excited to get plugged in and start serving. But all that means to say this, when we step back and all the time and energy we go, are we winning? How do we know if it's worth it? Are we doing what God's called us to do? And when you go, 31 people have already given their hearts and their lives to Jesus. That alone says you're doing what God has called you to do. So church, just thank you. I mean, I'm just blown away every week by what God is doing here. And it would not be possible if you did not provide a place where, where life change could be possible. So it is because of you that that happens. And I want to say thank you for being the incredible church that you are. People are blown away. We've had families, uh, even this past week, we had a family uh, that emailed us and said, hey, we just moved from out of state. We found you online. We're thinking about coming and, and just visiting. We just want to just let you know that we're coming and see all some, a few details. And, um, and then I saw a post later on that afternoon from, this, from that individual who had reached out and said, we're so thankful that we came, we found a church home, and now that worry is something we don't even have to think about anymore. So that right there is because you open your arms and you love people, and I'm excited about what God's doing here. So thank you for being incredible. Uh, but today we're going to jump in. Grab your note sheet for today's message. and uh, Relationship uncensored. Here's the idea of this relationship, uh, relationship series is that we just kind of take the rules off. We, we don't worry worry about some things that you're supposed to say or not supposed to say. Maybe there's some things that will kind of convict us this month as we start looking at some things about relationship. But the big idea is that we begin to uncover some things that will help us, again, in every aspect of relationship. Now, the last week of this month, you have an opportunity to kind of write the message and determine the content in which we talk about. So it's a and a style, which means on your Connect card, if you've got some relationship questions or some things you want to know, maybe you 
about relationships with children, with your coworkers, with your spouses, or your relationship with the Lord, you can write those on your Connect card, and we'll start collecting those questions this month, and then we'll address some of the most commonly asked questions on the last Sunday of, the, of this month. Or if you want to email them, you can email it to info at cultivatechurch.tv, and we'll take your questions there and start compiling those. So for the next three weeks, we're going to talk through some very specific things, and then in week four, as we close the series, we'll address questions that you have. But on your outline there at the very top, I put a verse of scripture, Matthew chapter 27, verses 37 and 39, and this is the heart of this series. It says, Jesus replied. This is one of the most important things that Jesus ever said. He said, there's really two big things for us. Number one is you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your mind. Meaning this, that Jesus has to be the first of all of our relationships. When we start talking about relationships and all the different concepts, we could bring together on this subject. Number one says, Jesus goes, if you're going to get it right, number one, it's me. I have to be first and foremost. And then secondly, the second thing is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. So if Jesus has to be number one, and that's the most important, but equally not to forget that we must love each other in the same way that we love Jesus. And I'm just going to be honest with you. When you take a look at culture around us, and even when you look at culture within the church world, we don't always get along very well. We don't play nice together all the time. Everybody's got different thoughts and opinions, and it divides us, and it separates us, and we have all these barriers. But Jesus just said, look, you need to love me, and then you need to love people. And that will solve a lot of the world's problems and a lot of the issues that you and I face. So I want to begin today uncovering a few things that I think are major roadblocks or hindrances for us being able to do this exact thing that Jesus has asked us to do. And then secondly, we're going to turn around and look at how we can overcome some of those obstacles by doing what the Word says for us to do and a few principles out of God's Word. So I want us to pray and just ask God to speak to us, and then we'll dive into the Word today. So Father... We love you so much today, and Father, we take a moment and we just celebrate life change. We thank you for what you're doing in and through Cultivate Church. God, we thank you for 31 people. God, who have found eternity, life change through you. God, not just living just the everyday mundane, but finding life on purpose, life to the full that you bring to us. So we just take today and we place you as our guest of honor. We celebrate you and we honor you today. But we ask that as we open up your word, and God, we just ask that you speak to us, that you teach us something today. We want to walk out of here with something tangible that we can begin to apply to our lives. Let this begin to... Uh, move in every area of relationship. God, if our, our work relationships, our home life, God, people that we have influence with, let us be people who love you and love others in the correct way. And today we give you all the thanks and appreciation for what you do in this word today. In Jesus' name, amen. So grab your outline and on the very front. I gave you some uh, things that I'm calling relationship censor. And so today we're going to talk about having unnecessary censorship and how we remove that from our life. But these these are censored relationships or three ideas or ways that you can tell that you've got some barriers or some difficulties in the relationships that you have. Number one is you need to write down there is no consideration. No consideration. One key thing that is important to any relationship is consideration. Being considerate of other people, not just thinking about ourselves. Considering God in everything that we do, any decision that we make, he should be at the top of the list of the consideration that we have for anything God would do in our life. And then secondly, the consideration of other people. But so many times we begin to live for ourselves. And the Bible knew this in James 4 and 1. Uh, it says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? So what's the source of a lot of problem, a lot of issue that we have? Doesn't it come from your desires that battle within you? And this is really important for any sort of conflict that we face within our relationships because most of the time we think it's everyone else that's wrong, but if we just step back for a second 
a lot of times we can say, you know what, maybe it's because of something that I anticipated. Maybe I anticipated someone to act a certain way, to be a certain way, to respond to something in a certain way, and they didn't do that. It didn't meet my expectations, and because I desired it or I wanted it, and I'm looking at them going, what is wrong with you? You know, why don't you do things right? like I want you to. You know what I'm saying? Like what is right is dependent on what I think is right and what someone else does. But the problem is that's resting from what's inside of me, my expectation. James 3 and 16 says, for wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, I underline that term selfish ambition, because there you have disorder and evil of every single kind. So where does the disorder in our relationships come from? Why does it seem that certain things just do not work? Certain personalities don't click together. I can't find my, my place at work. I can't get along with the coworkers. My boss drives me crazy. Why can't I find my spot here? A lot of times it's because of the selfish ambition that's within us. It's the desire that I have. And because my needs or my wants are unmet, everything else seems to be in disorder. Culture in our personal neighborhood. And, uh, nature says to pri prioritize ourself. So when culture says, and what I feel within myself is to prioritize myself above everything else. But God says that we are to prioritize others. So in other words, if I'm to love God above all, that means he becomes my priority above everything else, above my wants, above my desires, of the way I feel like something should happen. I know many of you are just like me. You've walked through stuff in life and you've looked at God and went, hey, that's not the way I had that plan. That is not what I anticipated, God, when I saw this unfolding. But God says, but you have to understand, that's why I'm God and you're not. I'm in control and you're not. So if he becomes my priority above everything, else, that means my desire or my selfish nature or ambition has to take the back seat to what God has planned. And no different, he says, to love everybody else as you love God. So that means that my nature needs to be able to recognize that people matter and that people are important and that we're all different. The issue is because we, we prioritize ourselves and our own selfish nature, we're just trained that way. In other words, think about when you were dating. Some of you married people, you can think back to some of those days when you were dating and you were single. Some of you are in that stage of life right now and you're dating and you're single. And here's what you did. You went out on a date and you judged that date by how they look and how they dress, how they talk, how good the meal was that they may have purchased for you. Come on, what kind of car they picked you up in. I mean, we got all these little things that we look at. You know, I, my wife, she looks at me weird if I scrape the fork on my teeth. I don't know. Do some of you do that? I don't, I don't, you think you don't, but you probably do because I don't even know I'm doing it. And I look over and she's looking at me like I'm about to kill you. Like one more bite. <laughs> and you're out. My son smacks when he eats, okay? He's not two yet, so it's kind of cute right now, okay? You're looking at him, and my wife told him yesterday, she said, you've got a few more months until that's not cute anymore, and then you've got to learn how to eat. It drives her crazy. Now, all I can think is there must have been something that made up for my fork noise and something when we knew each other before married because I feel like sometimes that's like the deal that's going to put me out of the house. I just feel like at any moment she's going to say at dinner time, you go to the back porch. I'm just looking for it. But when we're single, we, we do things that way. When it doesn't please us anymore or it's not what we want, we just trade them in. We go, you know what? It's, it's not you, it's me, right? It's not you, it's me. Or some of you may have said, it's not me, it's definitely you. You got to go. And you just trade them in. Everything in our life is dependent upon what pleases us. The, the place that you live, the things that you buy, the, the friends that you have. It's all dependent on, does this please me? It's our nature. But God so desperately wants us to check our nature to prioritize others and have a consideration of other people. It's just a part of who we are. I heard a joke, Valentine's is coming up, guys. If you don't know, Valentine's is coming up in a few weeks. And I heard this story, this guy that went and bought his girlfriend this most, I mean, beautiful bracelet. And uh, he went to a nice jeweler, it's kind of expensive, and he's going to have it engraved. And so the, so the jeweler said, do you want me to engrave your girlfriend's name on the back? And he said, you know what? No, don't put her name. I want you to put this, put, put on the back of that bracelet to my love. And that jeweler said, that's a good call. That's very romantic. And the guy said, well, I don't know about so romantic, but it is practical because if something happens, I can use this bracelet again on the next person. 
it's just our nature. Some of you are going, that's awful, and you have done it. You are, you are responsible for things like that. We're conditioned to do things that benefit us. It happens in our finances, in our, in our marriage relationships. That's one of the number one causes for, for discord and fighting is finances. One person thinks one way, and the other person thinks this way, and there's really no consideration about who's right, who's wrong, or what the balance in the middle is. We fight over that. Our addictions are selfish. The addictions that come in our life, regardless of what they are, whatever you're drawn to that you can't get yourself away from, it's because it's a selfishness that's drawing us to whatever that thing is affairs that happen in relationships or marriages. It's because of selfishness. It's a selfish draw that draws you away from something that you had a commitment to, your career or your job. When you go to work every day, most of us have this mentality. This is about me. It's about me getting what I want, me getting an advancement, me getting a raise, me getting what I need from this place when really, in the big picture, we're there to be a part of something much bigger than ourselves. We're to contribute something to something that's greater than one role that I, even I can play. We, find, we say things like, I just need to find myself. I love that. I love when somebody says, I just need to go find myself. And I'm thinking, well, just sit down where you are. You'll probably find yourself right there. You don't have to go far. You ain't got to run away. You ain't got to find new. You just need to sit down where you are and start looking because where you are is where God probably intended for you to be. Or we say things like, I just don't feel that way anymore. Can't tell you the number of people that I've sat with in relationships or marriages that just said, I just don't feel that way anymore. I just don't, I just don't feel that spark anymore. Well, you know, sometimes when a fire burns out, you got to start a new one, right? You got to take the same stuff and you got to clean it up a little bit. And you got to put some new logs right there and you got to get that fire rekindled. Sometimes in our relationships, we have to get proper perspective and have some consideration of other people other than just ourselves. So I ask us this morning, what would our relationships look like in every capacity if only we considered other people as greater than ourselves? If you looked at your spouse and you had consideration for them so much that you think about their thought process before your own, their feelings before your own, what if it, you went to work tomorrow and you just considered the company? What if you just considered your coworkers? What if you just considered your boss above your own thoughts or feelings? What if we all this year in 2018 just considered God above everything else? What if we really truly Put him in the seat of honor that he deserves. And instead of just saying, well, God, I do love you and I do things for you, but really you're more the kind of the, the genie in the bottle than you really are the, the Lord of my life. What if we considered the Lord this year to say, I'm going to follow you no matter what, what would happen in our relationships? And then number two, here's another barrier. This is a censored relationship when there's no communication. No communication. I love Proverbs 18, 13. This is, some, this is some wisdom here. Spouting off before listening to the facts is both shameful and foolish. In other words, it's dumb, okay? Be careful about what you say and how quick you say it because something very foolish is going to come out of your mouth. Every single one of us have done something like that. It's come out of your mouth before you thought about it, and when it's out, you can't take it back. It's not like you can do rewind and try it again. I mean, you've already said it. At this point, all you can do is respond, okay? It's, it's, either you say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that, or you just follow through with the same foolish spouting until you get yourself deeper and deeper in that hole. But a lack of communication is the, is the downfall of every relationship. Do you know that a poll said 70% of Americans that were polled, and said, so what do you think the most important factor in a relationship is? And 70% said communication is the most important factor in a relationship. I mean, I think that's common to all of us. If we just said, look, if you just talk to me, if we can just talk about it, if we can get on the same page, communication would help a lot. A lot of times it's because there's no consideration of what the other person thinks or feels. When there's no communication to go along with it, it allows my selfishness to blow up the entire situation bigger than it actually is. Do you know this, that lo uh, lack of communication is the second leading cause of divorce? So if 70% of Americans would say that communication is the most important factor and then the most leading cause, number two, of divorce, relationships falling apart, is the lack of communication, it simply means that there is a problem when we do not communicate. 
Clear communication is important. God wants us to communicate with Him. A lot of times the reason we don't hear from God or receive from God or we do things outside of God's best for our life is because we're not communicating with God. We don't go to Him first. We don't ask Him first for His opinion before we do other things. In your work relationships and your marriages and dating, all these things, it comes down to clear communication could solve a lot. And when communication is not clear, have you know that's how rumors get started, that's how things get twisted and out of place. I'll never forget when we launched this church. If you're our guest today, you don't know. Uh, we have we have a co-pastor team, myself, I'm Brandon Matthews, and then we have a, a, a pastor, Brandon Doss. He's in Columbiana today. Many of you know uh, uh, Brandon Doss. When we first launched the church, it was kind of confusing because people say, who's the pastor? Somebody say, hey, uh, Pastor Brandon. Well, they didn't realize there's two of us, right? You say, oh, it's whoever they saw on the platform that day. And I'll never forget one Sunday morning, we were still at the high school, and uh, Pastor Brandon had spoken that morning, and somebody that was new to the church had come and had met him in the lobby, and he introduced Danielle, his wife. He said, this is my wife, Danielle, and I'm Brandon. And then a few minutes later, someone else introduces my wife to this gentleman who is meeting everybody and said, hey, this is Pastor Brandon's wife, Jen. And that person stood there going, oh, <laughs> what kind of church is this? Like... <laughs> It got real weird really quick because to this individual, because the communication was not clear, it was a little muddy, suddenly Brandon Doss has two wives, Danielle and Jen, okay? Now, I just want you to know there's, nowhere, there's no truth in that at all. He's lucky that he's got Danielle. That's all I'm going to say. Now, to get two, you know that's out of the question. But that's how problems get started when communication isn't clear. It only makes things worse. Something that could be a misunderstanding, something that is simply blown out of proportion or is just out of perspective suddenly becomes real because our perception is our what? It's our reality. And if we perceive something in a particular way, suddenly that becomes the absolute truth when it's just a mix-up of communication. But if I had consideration for those around me, enough to sit and then to talk, it would bring a lot of clarity to what's happening. And then number three, here's, the, here's where this leads us, is when you have no concern. There's no concern. You ever met someone just had no concern for anyone else? No concern about what's happening. It's, a, it's almost a give up stage. This is what happens when you, you know you're at the no concern stage when you pull up to your job and you rest your head on the steering wheel before you get out of the car to go inside. When you just lay your head and go, God, I can't walk in the building. I need you to carry me. Come on, I need you to do this today because I can't. And you know you're at that place when you've just lost it. It's a give up mode and it's dangerous. The Bible says this, but you lazy bones... This is that give up. How long will you sleep? Will you wake up? Because a little extra sleep, a little more slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. Then poverty will pounce on you like a bandit. Scarcity will attack you like an armed robber. And I just underline that term poverty, meaning that everything that you have will be gone. If you get to this place in life with your relationship simply because we've let things go, without maintaining and keeping things in a proper order because it is disorder that, that causes issues. When this comes, then that's when things just begin to fall apart. And the problem is that most of us live, begin to live like nothing matters. When you get to this point, you begin to live like nothing matters. And the truth is, nothing will if you live that way. When you live like nothing matters, nothing will. And you only get to that place when you give up. When you give up on that marriage, when you give up on being able to overcome the difficulties and the relationships that you have, when you get to the point that you feel like God has forgotten you or that God's no longer listening to you or no matter how much you pray or ask God, it only gets worse. When we get to those places of defeat to where we have no concern, we just begin to live like nothing matters. And then the Bible says that it's because we get lazy. We fall asleep. And many of us, we want to so bad, we just get even busier with stuff that doesn't really matter because we try to mask the relationship problems that we have. I heard someone once say that travel, they said, you know what, I choose to be on the road and travel as much as I do because I don't want to go home. 
They said, there's more trouble at home than there is when I'm traveling on the road. So I keep myself busy into something so that I don't have to face the problems that I'm, that I'm having. So many of us will throw ourselves into work, we'll throw ourselves into sports, we'll throw ourselves into hobbies, we'll throw ourselves into other stuff so that we don't have to address the problems and the conflict that we're having. And we just begin to live like nothing matters. But I say this, when you get busy into something so that you ignore the problems, if the devil can't make you bad, the devil will make you busy. Because we feel like we're doing good when we're busy. But sometimes it's just the enemy trying to steal the good quality relationships that we have. It's a process. So it looks like this. When you get a little tired, a little sleep, a little extra slumber, basically what we do is we stop working on the relationship. It's like you get to work and you go, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to try anymore. It just is what it is. Just don't worry about it. I'm just going to go to work, do what I have to do to get by. And then when five o'clock hits, I'm going home. And then the marriage or dating relationships, just whatever it takes to keep peace in the house, I'm just going to do that. We just stop working on it. And then we stop paying attention to the relationship. We're used to you maintain things. It's like your car. When you bought that new car, if you ever had a, a new car or a new to you that was in good shape and it didn't have scratches, you parked miles away at Walmart, right? You looked for every buggy that was at Walmart. You began putting other people's buggies up to protect your car. But then... After you got a little lazy and you got a little scratch here, and a little ding here, suddenly you're on the front row at Walmart right around the buggy cart, right? You're surrounded by buggies. But it doesn't matter anymore. You stop paying attention to it because you've given up on keeping it new or keeping it nice. It's a process. And then we start drifting from the relationship. And then when you start drifting from your relationships, one day you wake up alone and unfulfilled, wondering how did we ever get here? And it's because we lost concern. For the relationships that we have. And so I'm asking us today, what if, what if we just step back and we just let God take inventory of our relationships and revive what feels to be dead? You know, Jesus was good at that. Jesus was good at taking things that were dead and raising it back to life. And God can do the same thing in the relationships that we have. So how do we do that? How do we work this out? And I want you to flip your outline over. And these are some uncensored relationships and the way to navigate these. Number one is you have to be intentional. You have to be intentional with every relationship that you have. The Bible says, teach us to number our days so that we may gain the heart of wisdom. Teach us to number our days. In other words, be intentional with everything we do. That's why we say living life on purpose around here. It's not just a slogan. Hopefully, it's something that we embrace and we live out. That it's an intentional way of life. So that everything I do is done with purpose that God has given to me. We often miss living for, uh, we often miss today because we're living for tomorrow. You ever realize that? You miss the moment. You miss today because we're living for tomorrow. We must be intentional with our moments. And so I'd I would encourage you, I'd challenge you to do this. Write down your top four or five values of your life. What do you value the most? What do you need to be intentional with? I wrote mine out. Number one was God. Should be for all of us. If you didn't know that, that's the first answer. I won't tell you the rest, but that's number one, okay? I'm going to give you a little, little hint on that one. God should be first. And then for me, it's my family. My family is my next responsibility. If I ruin my family and anything else in my life is, is a success, I have been a failure. God must be first and my family must be second. And then you guys are a close third, my church. I want this place to be a place of life change. I feel a call to this place and to do the best that I can do to lead and do what God's called me to do. And then everybody else that falls in line after that, I feel a responsibility to. But God has given us all three different things that we can do to be intentional. He's given you time, he's given you talents, and he's given you treasure. So in other words, he's given us all time. We wish we just had more time. We've all got the same amount of time. We got 24 hours in a day. And every day we have an opportunity to make the most of that time. And we have talents. God's gifted every single one of us with something. You have something that is a unique ability that only you have. And then you have treasure. You have resources. You have funds. You have stuff. You have something that can lend itself to the good of other people. So when I look at these and I look at God, I say, okay, with God, 
How am I giving to him with my time, my talents, and my treasure? What is it that I have that is, that is equipping or being intentional to make my relationship with God better? What is it about my time, my talents, my treasure that I have that I can give to my family? Time, talents, treasures that I can give to this church and that I can give to other people around me. If I'm going to be intentional, I have to steward my time, my talents, and my treasures well because these are the things that I have that are tangible that I can be intentional in the way that I live. And if you're intentional with every relationship that you have, that God has brought to you, it will be a better, higher quality relationship because of your intentionality that you live out, living that life on purpose with that relationship. So be intentional with the relationships that you value the most. And then number two, I say this, be talkative. If a lack of communication is a problem, then talk. Be talkative. The tongue can bring life or it can bring death. Those who love to talk will reap the consequences. So think about it. What you say matters. It has consequences. You don't think it does? Go to Walmart today. Find somebody with a little newborn baby and walk up and say, Oh, that is the most odd baby I have ever seen. <laughs> You don't think your words have power? Just talk to that new mom for just a second after you make that comment and see what she says. They matter. And there's four types of communication that we all have. These are conversations we have. We have an informal conversation with somebody every day. Hey, how are you? Good. Glad to, glad to hear it. Bye. I don't want to talk to you anymore today, okay? Informal. Just, hey, bye, how are you? That's it. You have business conversations. You do this within your marriage, within your relationship with God. In your marriage, you have business conversations. It goes like this. Hey, I'm running late. Can you pick up the kids? I'm going to play golf. Will you watch the kid? Like, it's these business transactions that happen. We have this on, the, on our plate, then we need this to happen, and we just need to communicate enough to get the business done. Many of us do this with God. Hey, I'm sick. Don't want the flu. Jesus needs you. Bubble right here. It's all I'm asking for. We'll see you later, okay? That's all we need. We just need that to happen, okay? It's these business transactions that we have. Then we have problem conversations. It, it looks like this. The car's making a noise. Who do I take it to? Okay? The, the dishwasher is broken. I'm not washing these dishes. What do we do? It's problem-solving conversations. You have to talk because there's a problem. We all have these. Many of us talk to God in this order. Hey, God, problem. Need you to do this. Here's my list. Talk to you later. Do it by 2 o'clock, okay? You give a deadline. Like, it's these problem conversations. But it's really the fourth kind, the intimate conversations, that we really need to place in the valued relationships of our life. What if our relationships with our spouses, our, our co-workers, our friends, with the Lord, what if they moved into stuff that said, what do you dream about? What are you going through? What are you facing? What can I help you with? What can I pray for you about? What are some problem areas in our life right now that we can address together? What can we do to make this a healthier relationship? Those are the type of intimate conversations that we need because, again, the lack of communication and the clarity of it matters. I'll never forget when Asher was uh, just a few months old, we, we needed someone to watch Asher one day. And uh, I come home and my wife said, she said, hey, I hired a babysitter uh, that's coming uh, to watch Asher today. I said, oh, you did? I said, well, um, where did you get the babysitter? Uh, from, from the internet. I, I hired somebody off the internet. And my heart sank. I said, you did what? I'm thinking Craigslist. Like I'm picturing, <laughs> I'm picturing this like de decrepit old lady, you know, like, where's the baby? I'm here to watch the kid. You know, like that's what I picture coming to my front door. And I just started going, we are not, and I just, I mean, I just lost. I was like, we're not hiring somebody off the internet to come here and watch my baby. We're not doing that. And then she, after I like calmed down, she says, uh, I said, who is this person? She said, well, there, there's a site. Uh, it's, it's, it's a site that's reputable to do background checks, and there's a 16-year-old a girl from here in Alabaster. Um, she's a homeschool student, and she watches children on the side, and, and she's proven, and they have a track record from her. And I was like, oh. So it was like something legitimate. <laughs> like it wasn't just a, an old lady off of like Craigslist. She said, do you think I would hire an old lady off of Craigslist to watch our son? I said, well, I guess, I'm, I guess I'm exposed. Yes, I thought that's what you had done. I mean, that's exactly what I thought. Communication, it matters. Let's get to the details. Let's stop the surface level, and let's just get to the core of it and have meaningful relationships with people. It'll change the way that our relationships are. And the number three, the last thing I'll tell you is you need to be invested in your relationship. There's no, there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friend, meaning in everything I'm invested I'll do anything to make it happen, to make it work. And so today, I'm, I'm, in, 
I mean, just encouraging us and challenging us all to go the distance, invest in the relationships that we have in our lives. So I want to invite the band to come back up, and I want to pray for us today. And two things on my mind today, and especially in this investment. As we just bow our head, close our eyes, I would say this. As we've talked through having just quality relationships, the number one thing that I can tell you is it's because of Jesus these things are possible. These are principles from God's word that we can live out, but it's the enablement of Jesus that helps us to do it. And there is no greater love than someone that would lay down their life for a friend, and that's what Jesus has done for us. And so today, if you happen to be in this room or watching by the internet and you've never given your heart to Jesus, I encourage you today is your day. He's invested everything in you, and I would encourage you to invest your life today in him. And so I want to give you an opportunity. I'm going to pray for you in just a second, lead you through a prayer. But if you make that decision today, I encourage you to put it on that Connect card. Let us know so we can pray for you this week. And then for all of us in this room or by the internet, I just know relationships are difficult. And I realize it's one of the most draining things that you and I can have in our life when they're not healthy. But let's just peel back all the stuff. Let's just take the sensor away and say, God, just search me. And whatever is unhealthy, God, I want to correct it today. I want to, I want to move in a direction of healthy relationships in my life. So Jesus, today, we thank you. We celebrate you. Father, we ask if there's one person in this room that don't have a relationship with you, that today would be the day. Forgive us of our sins. We commit our life to you, and we thank you for forgiveness. Today, Jesus, you're number one in our lives. And Father, for all of us with relationships and issues and problems, we all have them. We all have strains and relationships, but I'm praying today would be a day that we begin a new course, just to take the censorship off. God, just begin to live in reality, to begin to live in healthier relationships because your word enables us to do it. And in all of it, Jesus will give you credit because you're the source of where our help comes from. Thank you for loving us and desiring good relationships for our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, church. Can we put our hands together? Celebrate him today.